Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Are You Ready to Garden? So I'm going to talk about weed control options without pesticides. Many people call our cooperative extension office and really want to know, you know, how do I control weeds um, with alternative methods? So we're going to focus on alternative methods tonight. Let's start off with talking about what is a weed. So a weed is any plant out of place. And if you go to this website that we have at Rutgers University, uh, the New Jersey Ag Experiment Station, you will actually be able to identify many of the weeds that we see across the state of New Jersey. And um, uh, that will give you very visual uh, pictures to help identify the weeds that you're finding in your landscape. And that's very important to know whether or not they're annual or perennial weeds. Um, and many of the strategies we're going to talk about today will actually prevent problems across the board. Um, but we want you to be able to identify the problems that you're facing. And then also, if you're facing some invasive weed problems, uh, like mile a minute weed, you will be able to identify those. There's also a, a project that uh, Dr. Terry Beesenkahn, one of my colleagues here at Rutgers, is doing with iNaturalist. Uh, if you go on this website, uh, you will find um, uh, great pictures and information on weeds that we are finding throughout New Jersey's landscapes and gardens. Um, so this is the link that you need to go on to. Um, it will provide information about proper identification and uh, also reporting uh, that you can do uh, to become a citizen uh, information provider for our weed science program throughout the state. So when we look at a landscape, we're looking at, you know, what will people find acceptable within their landscape setting? Um, I'm sure most people, unless they're producing dandelion and wine, don't want to see this many dandelions in their landscape. But many weeds are an indicator that there are other problems going on within the landscape setting, whether it be turf grass or within the garden. So we need to look at uh, what are the underlying factors. We need to first take a soil test to determine the pH of the soil, uh, determine whether or not there are compaction problems or pH problems with acidity. So the first step is, is to really do a soil test. Um, to determine whether that pH is within that acceptable zone between 6.2 to 6.5 for grasses and, and many of our uh, trees and shrubs within the landscape. Uh, but some of our trees and shrubs like rhododendrons and azaleas and some of the pine trees require lower pH. So with that, we're going to talk about that today in terms of the requirements of these different plants. But when we see weeds as the predominant species, uh, then we need to take a little bit closer look at the underlying factors such as pH, uh, such as soil uh, uh, nutrient values. Uh, so the, the, the soil test is really the best way for us to approach uh, what's going on and how we can best address that. Also, we wanna look at soil compaction. If we try to dig into our soils with a shovel or a spade uh, uh, or a trowel and we find that it's very difficult to dig into those soils and they're heavily compacted, there are many weeds that uh, will predominate in those sort of conditions. So we have to make sure that we're doing everything that we possibly can to improve soil quality so that we can get turf grass or vegetables to grow uh, and be the favorite species in those environments. So one of the lessons that we learned from our natural environment is that nature abhors a vacuum. So if you have open space, um, there are gonna be many weed species, uh, invasive species and other species that will just take over those areas um, if we don't properly adjust soil pH and the nutrient conditions uh, to properly um, grow the plants that we want to grow within that landscape or garden setting. 
Um, so we're going to give you a lot of great tips today on how you can modify those conditions uh, in order to ensure that the plants that you want to grow will grow properly and to eliminate some of the problems. And one of the lessons that we learned from nature is the fact that if you look out right now, this was a picture as of yesterday, in how the native environment adapts to um, controlling weeds. You see this uh, large area in the woods uh, right next to our Earth Center, which has a lot of leaves on the ground. Those leaves are actually providing a mulch to prevent weed seeds from germinating and getting sunlight and competing with the trees and the shrubs that are there. So uh, those leaves provide a perfect mulch and will adjust the pH accordingly for those trees and shrubs and have a natural recycling of nutrients at the proper level so that those plants will grow at a maximal rate and will have the least amount of competition within that natural environment. So when we look at how does nature control weeds, this is a good example of whether it be leaves or pine needles around your pines, uh, nature is actually helping to control competition from other species naturally. And we can do the same thing within our own landscapes by using leaves, by using uh, compost around materials, uh, around our plant materials to help control weed problems. Because whenever we prevent sunlight from getting to those literally tens of thousands of weed seeds from germinating, uh, we can prevent a lot of problems within our landscapes and gardens. So uh, one of the things I ask people within the many lectures that I give at Rutgers University and through Cooperative Extension is, what is the ideal or preferred landscape? Uh, one of the things that history can teach us is that clovers are actually beneficial in lawns because clovers fix nitrogen. Uh, they share the nitrogen with the plants around them. And if you go back not too many generations ago, we had clovers in the 70s and 60s that were a natural part of our landscape settings. And that's because clovers were actually a very good thing in lawns because they helped us reduce the inputs of uh, nitrogen fertilizers. So one of the things that we are doing within our uh, Cooperative Extension New Jersey Agricultural Experiment St uh, Station programs is helping people to realize that there are certain plants that we see appear that are actually beneficial, like clovers, especially white clover, uh, to our lawns and landscapes that can actually fix nitrogen and help break up compacted soils. And many of our soils in Middlesex County and North, because we have heavy clay soils, uh, the actual um, uh, addition of, of different types of clover can actually break up those compacted soils and help us to grow uh, healthy turf grasses as well as add nitrogen to our gardens. And one of the things we can look at is the addition of microclover. So microclover is just simply white clover that we use within our landscape and, and, and uh, garden settings. It grows a little bit lower to the ground, and it's actually able to take nitrogen, the 78% of nitrogen that's out of the air, fix that nitrogen and share it with the plants around it so that we can have nitro natural nitrogen fixation with those plants. So it can be a very beneficial uh, addition to our landscapes and gardens. And we are doing research right now where we're using different types of clovers and other uh, beneficial um, uh, different types of cover crops to help us fix nitrogen and compete with weed problems within our landscapes and within our garden settings. So microclover is something that you can look for online. Just put that into your search and about one to two ounces per acre. Um, usually I, I tell people to start out with about two ounces per per thousand square foot, not per acre, and use Dutch white clover uh, because Dutch white clover will provide that nitrogen fixation and help us compete with a lot of our um, uh, weeds that are there as, and it will help to break up compacted soils 
uh, and it's overall it's probably one of the best things to help also help stimulate beneficial microbes within the soil uh, so that we can uh, have healthy plants. So it's not just a matter of competing with weeds, it's a matter of looking at uh, the beneficial plants, the beneficial microbes that are actually going to um, enhance the whole en environmental and, and bacterial and, and fungal uh, organisms that are in our soils so that we can have that proper balance to enhance the growth of beneficial plants within our landscapes and gardens. And if you look at, first, I want you to, to, to consider looking at your landscape conditions. This is a good friend of mine who went to school with, and he actually adapted his landscape uh, based on his uh, the amount of sunlight and the soils that he had. So he is growing here understory plants because he has limited sunlight coming in this area because of all the trees. And if you uh, grow plants that are adapted to your sunlight and soil conditions, uh, they will help to compete with weeds that are occurring at your site um, and be able to provide that coverage and plants that are best adapted to those site conditions. So that's a, a very important thing to first consider. So you need to take a soil test and uh, Stephanie Murphy and our colleagues at Rutgers University at the Soil Testing Lab are more than happy this time of the year to take your soil test. And if you contact your local cooperative extension office, they can provide those soil test kits or you can contact the lab directly. And Angela will provide that link uh, shortly. So working with your site conditions, providing plants that are currently adapted to the sunlight, the pH, and the conditions of soil that you have is really the best thing that you can do to make sure that you're competing, or I should say out-competing weeds that are occurring within that landscape setting. So in areas where we have shade, we wanna grow plants like liriope, hostas, rhododendrons, azaleas that are adapted to 15 to 30% shade conditions. Um, utilize mulches to prevent weed problems in those areas, uh, whether they be native mulches. And we're going to talk a lot more about this over uh, the next hour. So by utilizing these plants, uh, we can uh, really maximize uh, plant growth, uh, minimize weed invasion at the same time by growing plants that are adapted to your specific soil conditions that you have within your landscape or garden. And one of the things that we can do to reduce uh, problems within the um, uh, turf setting is encourage a healthy, dense turf grass. So there are ways that we can do that by reducing compaction problems, by selecting the right turf grass species, such as fine fescues, turf type tall fescues, um, by fertilizing only the areas that we need to fertilize, so we're not fertilizing areas that have weeds, um, by uh, decreasing um, soil compaction by doing core aeration. Typically, we do core aeration in the fall, but we can also do that in the spring if we need to, um, to help reduce compaction problems. And one of the key things you can do in, in, in many of your turf grass areas is simply increase your mowing height to three inches. Um, because what happens when we do that is we actually will see the turf grass will grow and it will be protected. And the intercalary marriage stem at the base of that turf grass will be protected uh, by mowing that turf grass at a, at a higher mowing height. We also wanna recycle grass clippings because one of our professors at the New Jersey Ag Experiment Station Dr. Joe Heckman has proved over the years uh, through research that recycling grass clippings helps to improve the growth of, of turf grass by reducing weed problems. And actually your turf will green up earlier in the season, uh, stay green longer later in the season uh, and prevent a lot of weed problems overall as long as we're mowing higher. So we wanna mow at three inches. Um, so adequate sunlight 
really incredibly important for turf grass. Avoid growing grasses in moderate to dense shade. Uh, in areas where you have dense shade, you want to plant ground covers that are already adapted to shade conditions. Uh, and if you look on our Rutgers Cooperative Extension um, website, you'll see many of the ground covers through our fact sheets that are adapted to shade conditions to replace uh, some of the turf grass. So we want uh, sunlight, you know, eight to 10 to 12 hours of sunlight to grow turf grass, whether it be fine fescues or turf type tall fescues. The fine fescues can get away with a little bit less sunlight, but we wanna have soils uh, that are well drained as well so that we can make sure that we grow turf grasses that are healthy and have less weed competition. Another thing that we want to do in turf areas is to balance the pH to 6.2 to 6.5. Um, so by taking a soil test, we can ensure that our turf grass and many of our vegetable plants are going to grow optimally. Um, we want to make sure they have adequate moisture, about an inch to an inch and a half of uh, irrigation or rainfall per week. Um, and plants that are being competed with with shallow rooted trees, such as maples, um, we want to make sure that uh, we're not growing grass in those areas, but we're putting mulch down. But we want to protect our trees because those trees and those shrubs provide um, an ideal environment for our landscape and a lot of value to the landscape. So we wanna make sure that we're supporting both the trees and the shrubs at the same time within that landscape setting. So one of the things that we can do to encourage uh, healthy turf grass, and then we'll get into some of the other plant materials, uh, is make sure that our mower's sharp, uh, the, the blades are sharp so that we uh, have very quick healing of those grass blades so we don't have disease problems encroaching. We want to irrigate uh, those areas early in the morning um, to prevent disease issues from occurring in those landscapes. We want to keep that uh, turf grass mowed at about three inches or higher to reduce weed competition. Because if you think about it, all those weed seeds that are blowing in from all of the neighbors around that don't necessarily do herbicides or, or, or uh, uh, have adequate uh, weed control, um, by growing the grass uh, at a higher height, we can actually prevent those weed seeds from reaching the soil. And by growing the grass higher, we also see here in this slide that we'll have uh, better root systems developing. We'll shade the crown tissue of the root systems of turf grass. And overall, we'll actually have a much healthier turf grass environment. So seeding is very important to make sure you're seeding at the right rate. Most of the seeding should be done in the fall, but if you need to see it in the spring for areas that um, are, are very weak or have very little turf grass, you can go ahead and do that. Uh, but utilize our fact sheets to tell you how much uh, seed you need per, air, per thousand square foot to make sure that you're adequately seeding at the right rate. And you can step that up a little bit in spring seeding because you're competing with a lot of weed seeds. There are literally tens of thousands of weed seeds that we're competing with uh, in the springtime. Um, so we need to make sure we're doing that. And the fine fescues and the hard fescues are really some of our best varieties or, or best grass types, I should say, for competing with weeds uh, with low maintenance turf grass. So look for uh, fine fescues and turf type tall fescues uh, that are available through most of your garden centers. And one place that you can look at is www.ntep.org, which provides a lot of information on the latest research that we have available through the Rutgers uh, New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. And they will have everything from the latest varieties that have disease resistance to uh, early uh, green up, um, de high density, plantings, so some of the uh, varieties that will compete better with weed problems that would occur early in the season will green up early in the season, and also it will provide information on pest-resistant varieties um, 
that have resistance to disease and insect problems. So this is a great place to, uh, to uh, actually access information from Rutgers University, as well as Penn State, and our ag experiment stations throughout the uh, tri-state area. One thing that you can do is, um, uh, you know, overseed. You can do that in the spring. Your best time probably is in the fall. But if you have areas that are open and exposed, then you may want to go ahead and overseed those areas. What you see on the top here is an overseeder. And the overseeders that you rent from many of our garden centers will actually have the set the proper settings uh, based on the type of seed that you are seeding in that area, whether it be turf type tall fescue, fine fescues, bluegrass, or ryegrass. Um, and you want to select those varieties based on uh, the um, settings that uh, and the varieties that we recommend through the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. Another thing that you can do is um, apply sod to areas and you have a wider window that you can do that in the season because sod, as long as you keep it irrigated and you properly establish those areas so that you have good contact with the root system with the soil, then you'll be able to establish turf grass very quickly um, and be able to have a, a weed free area. You want to buy sod that's locally produced so that the sod is adapted to our local conditions. Uh, many of the weeds that we see in our area um, are either annual or perennial weeds and by properly adjusting the pH of the soil uh, the nutrients and, and addressing compaction issues, we can reduce a lot of problems. You see here on number one, that's broadleaf plantain. On number two, that's chickweed. Number three, that's purslane. Uh, number four, that's uh, uh, clover, which is actually a beneficial. That's white clover right there. And then five is dandelion. So dandelion, as you can see here, has a very deep deep taproot. So if we have a deep taproot, then we need to um, be able to control that if we're going to, uh, because it, it produces a lot of seed, as you can see, the top portion, but that taproot is going to survive. So even if we go out there to try to control that root, we have to go out there uh, uh, and, and go out there periodically to be able to, to re actually reduce those nutrients in that root system so we can get adequate control of that weed problem. So one of the things that we do within all garden settings, especially within our vegetable gardens, is we look for different types of uh, garden hose to help remove the weeds that are currently there. And if you go online, you will see many different types of uh, garden hose that we can use. We wanna make sure that they're very sharp uh, that they're sturdy enough, that they're uh, ergonomically uh, designed, that we can use them easily uh, within our garden setting to remove the weeds that are there. Uh, the best time to remove weeds, of course, is when they're small. Uh, when the soil is just a little bit moist, uh, it will take less energy. And even on farms where we're using constant herbicides, we still have to do uh, go out and do periodic hoeing to control weed problems. And I'm going to show you in a minute here how weed problems really compete with the production value of many of our uh, different species that we have in the garden. So the idea with, with hose is we want to make sure that we have to keep the blade sharp. Uh, we can do that ourselves if we have a grinding wheel. Uh, you want to select a tool that works for you that is easy to use um, and feels uh, good to the touch and is easy for you to uh, utilize in your garden and landscape settings. We want to remove weeds when they are small because it's easier to actually uh, remove those weeds because they have less of a root system established. Uh, if we go out and we weed early in the morning, then we're going to have less uh, problems with uh, heat issues when we go out. Uh, plus, it'll be a lot easier because the soil is a little bit moister in the morning. 
Uh, we want to wear gloves to protect our hands and make sure we find the right tool. And if you go online, you will find many different types of tools that you can utilize uh, for weeding. And if we look at that slide before, uh, the one, the pointed um, uh, hoe that you see here is a, a, what's called a Japanese hoe. You can also get ex uh, hose with extension on them so you can actually control the length of those hose to adjust to uh, specifically to a person's needs so that we can control weeds. And I can tell you that even on our family uh, farm where we do a lot of high level production, we still go out and use hose for weeding because even if we're using herbicides, there are just many instances where herbicides are either just not effective and we have to go out and use mechanical means to uh, eliminate those weeds. And here you can see that where we've hand weeded um, after about a month after planting, that uh, you can see the difference between hand weeding and no herbicide at planting. Um, just by protecting those plants for a little while, letting the root system get established in our vegetable gardens, uh, we allow those plants to be able to flourish within that particular setting, um, and we'll see a better production system. Um, what happens is if we don't control weeds, is that those weeds, uh, the root system uh, uh, is competing with water, nutrients, and light. Um, and we'll see that, uh, especially species we're seeing that are resistant to some of our current herbicides that we're using, like Palmer amaranth, um, can reduce yields by 70% or even much higher just by having uh, one a uh, weed crop for each one of the uh, planting areas or planting holes that we establish within the garden. So there's huge competition when we're competing with nutrients, when we're competing with sunlight, uh, we could see some real problems with competition. And here you actually see some research that was done and I wanna give credit to uh, Myers and uh, also Terry Biesenkamp for sharing this that when we're looking at potato production, what's, it's a was a big crop in New Jersey at one time, you can see as you go from the left where you have uh, no competition of weeds like Palmer amaranth uh, with potatoes to as we move to the right side, as we have more weed competition, we'll see that the yield decreases dramatically with increased weed competition. And that's because less sunlight is actually getting to uh, the beneficial plants in our vegetable garden. And so there, with that competition for sunlight and also for nutrients and for water, we're gonna see a direct correlation uh, with decreasing yield. So in weed areas, when we do research, we also look at what we call critical weed-free periods to be uh, more specifically defined as the minimum length of time during which the crop should be uh, mostly weed free to avoid an economic loss. So in other words, we're decreasing that competition so that we can get a viable crop. Um, and in home gardens, that's really important because we wanna make sure that when we're doing all that work out there, that we're getting uh, the most that we can out of our production system um, and reducing the weed competition that we have in those areas so, because we spend money on those seeds and on those transplants and on our time. So we wanna make sure that we're reducing uh, that competition. If you look at uh, weed-free areas for vegetables, like for instance with uh, cucumber, if we can keep those areas uh, free of weeds for two to five weeks, we'll see a dramatic increase in yield. Same with sweet potato um, and watermelon and tomato. You know, it's a matter of, you know, there's quite a bit of research out there that shows uh, that by reducing competition with weeds, uh, we can increase our yields and also increase uh, the health of those plants because when we have a lot of weeds in an area, we also decrease the amount of air movement in that area, which increases disease problems. 
So by decreasing uh, weeds, we, we can also decrease weed problems because we increase air circulation to those areas. Any questions on what we've had so far, Angela? In particular to nut sedge, how would you suggest getting rid of nut sedge in the lawn? Because I know that's a very difficult weed to suppress. Okay, so nut sedge is a very difficult weed. And typically that occurs in areas where there are some compaction problems. Typically we've brought in some mulch that brought the nut sedge into those areas. We often will see a sandier soil where we have nut sedge problems. And depending on the specific species of nut sedge that we have, will determine uh, you know, how aggressive we have to be. But for the most part, um, spot treatment of those, and I know we're, today we're not talking about weed, weed control with herbicides, but nut sedge is a, is a real big issue. So in, in, in that case, we, need, we may need to look at spot treatment of uh, herbicides to those areas where we have nut sedge or increase the density of the turf grass uh, within that system. Um, one of the things we need to look at is compaction and pH. If we don't adjust the pH to 6.2 to 6.5, and there are compaction problems, then we may see more nutshades occur in those areas. But where we typically see turf grass uh, and other beneficial uh, plant species growing, uh, we will see them able to outcompete nutshades. Uh, if we're talking about not using chemicals as we are today, we need to remove the plant itself and the nutlets that are growing beneath the ground in order to get adequate control uh, of nut sedge. Nut sedge is a real bear to, to try to control. Referring to veg gardens and using cover crops, would you recommend clover, any sort of clover in the veg garden? Yes, cover so crop? we can use uh, white clovers, we can use red clovers for vegetable gardens. Um, and uh, we'll get into veg crops in just a minute. But one thing that we do need to do, as this slide suggests, is we need to remove the seed heads of weeds as they're developing um, out of the garden so that they produce uh, less seeds to inoculate and take over the rest of our gardens. One of the biggest challenges that any gardeners face is weed competition. So if we can reduce the seed bank that develops over time uh, with uh, uh, weed seed heads developing, by removing them um, because those weed seed heads can, can last anywhere between three and 10 years, depending on the weed. So we really want to reduce the overall uh, uh, accumulation of those weed seeds occurring. So by, you know, if we just let areas go, we're gonna actually increase the, the competition and the uh, sources of weeds that occur within our vegetable gardens uh, as well as our, our lawns areas. But typically with lawns, we're decreasing weed uh, head seeds developing by mowing. Some of the methods that we use for weed control, uh, we're gonna skip over the chemical weed control methods today. We can talk about that at a later session. And we're gonna focus on cultural practices, tillage mowing, flame cultivation, uh, and hand removal, as we just talked about a minute ago. So. Uh, hand removing weeds uh, is a form of mechanical control where we're removing the tops and the root systems. And in the case of nut sedge, as you just mentioned, we're removing those nutlets that are occurring uh, beneath the soil. So we're preventing those nutlets from surviving. And regular mowing actually helps to control weeds on, on many different levels, uh, as well as mulching, which we'll get into. We'll also talk about burning, steam, sterilization, uh, and solar uh, solarization of areas, as well as we just talked about seed removal of mature plants to make sure that we don't have um, seeds that are lasting into the following seasons. So one of the things that farmers do is they do plowing, moldboard plowing. And one of the reasons they do moldboard plowing is because they are burying those weed seeds that have accumulated over the past two to five to seven to 10 years so that those weed seeds will break down in the underlying soil 
Um, now in a home garden, how that um, how we can take a look at that is by doing a double digging by preventing those weed seeds from actually um, having sunlight get to them so that they don't germinate. But many of these weed seeds can survive for a long time. Now, if we look at some of the resistant weed seeds, we find that if we have no deep tillage, we're going to have more weeds occur in areas where we don't do deep tillage. But where we have uh, usually some type of double digging or plowing within that environment, we'll see better control of weed species in those areas because we're burying those weed seeds uh, deeper into the ground and then therefore many of the microorganisms are breaking down those weed seeds before they get a chance to build up. And we'll see that, um, you know, this is just a slide and I want to thank Terry Biesenkan for sharing this slide, um, but it shows the longevity of uh, something like Palmer amaranth seed that even after 36 months, we can still see germination of that seed and it decreases over time. Uh, but amaranth is pigweed. So basically on many farms, this is a real problem. So over time, we'll see the decrease in certain weed species if we've been controlling them over a period of time, it will naturally break down and reduce the ability of that uh, weed seed to reproduce over the season. So some of the things that we can do in our home garden settings and landscapes is use wood chips, uh, organic. We're going to talk about this in a little bit more detail. Use straw. Or, uh, I would I would probably not lean more towards hay uh, because of the weed seeds that are concentrated. Um, we will also in some uh, settings where we have the capacity to do that, utilize um, uh, the ability to uh, decrease weed species that are there and provide mulch uh, uh, cover that will provide at least two to three inches of mulch to prevent the sunlight from getting to weed seeds that are going to germinate. So one of the things that we can do and is done in many areas of the world where they don't have uh, herbicides is we can use what's called soil solarization. And it's basically a, a four step process whereby we simply rototill the area that we're looking to uh, uh, use the sunlight to destroy weeds. Uh, we then uh, uh, smooth out that area um, drape clear plastic over that so the sunlight can get through that area. Um, we will then irrigate that area so that we have uh, adequate moisture available, and then we'll put clear plastic over that. And what that does is that builds uh, anywhere from four to six weeks. We will leave that on in August through the beginning of September. And what that does is allows the sunlight to destroy many of the weed seeds and other uh, disease and insect problems that we have within the soil. So if we have an area where we can set aside and we can use the natural um, solar radiation of the sun, that's called soil solarization, but we have to make sure we're following all these practices of increasing moisture, of tilling the area, of covering that area with plastic and then sealing the plastic on each end um, so that uh, increases the heat value and the solar radiation, and that will destroy many of our weed seeds and fungi and deleterious organisms that exist within the soil. Uh, what we'll see is that little droplets will appear on the surface of that plastic, and we start as we start to see those droplets uh, become less and less, we need to irrigate underneath that plastic because it's the sunlight reacting and uh, steam sterilizing that soil that really helps us to get control of many of the weeds and disease problems that we see in those areas. Any questions on that, Angela? So if someone asked, how deep do you need to bury the weed seed? So typically if we go six to eight inches down, uh, it, it really even to four inches, um, that's probably enough for those weed seeds to start breaking down. Uh, many of the uh, weed seeds that we typically see, whether they be annual or perennial, 
uh, depending on the specific species of plant, uh, will last between three to five years and still remain viable under the soil. And that's why many farmers do fall plowing because they're taking those weed seeds that have accumulated from their property as well as surrounding properties um, and burying them. And then the microbes within the soil will actually start to break down uh, those organisms or those uh, seeds that I should say that are in the soil. Do you have to till after removing plastic before veg plants are planted? No, I would not recommend uh, additional tillage because if you do additional tillage, you may be bringing up weed seeds that are below that area that still haven't broken down. So what I would do is after you've done soil solarization, and by the way, this is done in South America because in many parts of South America where they don't have um, a lot of the, the chemical uh, options that we have, this is a pretty common practice uh, on many farms in those areas of the world. You would only till the very, very surface just to get it so that you could establish your plants, but you don't want to go too deeply after you've done soil solarization. Otherwise, you'll be bringing up uh, long-term perennial weeds that have still survived. Do you use black or clear plastic for this? Clear plastic is always used with soil solarization. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because it allows the sunlight and ultraviolet radiation to uh, basically penetrate, uh, build up the heat concentration that we need in there in order to kill those weed seeds. It's also very important to keep the soil moist um, so that the uh, intensity of that uh, solar radiation and the heat uh, that's generated from that can actually get down into the lower layers of soil. Okay, uh, what thickness should the clear plastic be? Uh, one to four mil. I mean, uh, yeah, it's it's um, use what you have. I mean, to be honest with you, it's it's still going to work. Um, it, the, the only pr uh, time that it doesn't work is when you have holes in that plastic, and it allows that heat to escape. So the idea is that you're really making sure that uh, the the heat within that system is uh, building up within uh, underneath that plastic. Another option we have is flaming weeds. And the problem with flaming, and some organic growers will do this, is that it's a temporary short term. It kills the tops of the weeds. So we have to go out there periodically and reflame. And there's a little bit of risk involved when we're using different gases to flame weeds. Um, and it's also producing carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide. So even though that is an alternative, it's probably not your your best bet in terms of controlling weeds, even though you see that on the internet. Uh, so some cultural practices, uh, in addition to what we've talked about, uh, is, is crop competition, making sure that the plants that we are putting in are close enough uh, so that they are shading out the weeds, that we are rotating crops within that particular garden setting. So we're not growing the same plants that are within the same family two years in a row um, because many weeds and diseases and insects that are associated with that crop um, will be uh, prevalent within a longer period of time. So we wanna make sure that we're rotating the plants that are in different families and also, we want to make sure we're growing cover crops like clover uh, and, and perennial rye and cereal rye uh, so that we can um, adequately decrease uh, competition from weeds and disease problems. So one of the things we do in commercial agriculture is we'll use something um, like a, a perennial rye and then we'll crimp that and then we'll do no-till planting. But you can do something similar and even in your small scale garden. Uh, just by simply using cover crops um, and then at a certain time of the year, just going in there, um, uh, putting a tarp over those to kill them back, a uh, planting within the residue that you have. And if you've planted a cereal rye or plants like sorghum in, in your gardens, you can actually uh, see uh, a, a certain amount of weed control that occurs by using cereal rye, 
But in small gardens, you can even just simply use uh, perennial ryegrass to cover those areas and then uh, kill that back by putting a tarp over it uh, and then going ahead and planting your plants within that setting uh, and then using mulches that we're going to talk about in a minute to prevent light from getting to those weed seeds. So that's really a practical way for you to take what we've learned in commercial agriculture and utilize that for your vegetable gardens. And here you can see where we've had rye cover or where we've planted in that um, and where we didn't have cover, uh, that we get pretty good weed control where we've had cover. So how can we emulate that within our uh, particular vegetable garden? We can use straw. So if we can get good clean straw materials that we can use, uh, we can use that as a substitute and that will prevent light from getting to those weed seeds and germinating those. Um, and we can also plant, uh, put in transplants that basically uh, are already established and that will help us to get a jump on the weeds that are trying to establish themselves within that vegetable garden. So what we have done at the Earth Center and uh, what Angela has done is she's used straw and sometimes, you know, we'll put down a certain amount, you know, anywhere from two to three inches of straw and then we'll come back in and put additional straw on there uh, to make sure that we maintain that two to three inches. And what that does is that prevents sunlight from getting to those weed seeds and germinating so that we can grow many of our crops. Um, we want to make sure we eliminate any seed heads in those areas. We don't want seed heads in the straw as well. So when we uh, get good rye straw or wheat straw, we want to make sure that when we buy that straw, it doesn't have seed heads that are going to germinate. The advantage of using straw mulch is relatively inexpensive. We want to uh, moisten that straw down right after we have applied it so that the wind doesn't blow it all over the place. Uh, reapply as needed, so you want to get a few extra bales of uh, straw, depending on the size of your garden. Reapply as needed. Uh, one thing that we do need to do is pull that straw back a little bit from the main base of the plant so that we don't attract slugs and other uh, pest problems that could be problematic during the growing season. Any questions on that, Angela? Sure. Uh, would you recommend putting a newspaper or cardboard down underneath yes. the straw mulch? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've had some growers that have actually used newspaper. And if you're using newspaper or cardboard, one of the things you can do is make sure you poke enough holes in it so that moisture is penetrating down into the root system of the plants that you're trying to grow. Uh, because that's really important that we get moisture and oxygen down to those root systems. Um, we've actually had some growers that have um, collected pizza boxes on a regular basis um, and use those around plants, but they do poke holes in those so that uh, at the same time they're preventing uh, sunlight from getting to weeds. They're allowing water and oxygen to get to the root systems of the plants that you're trying to grow. And we are using straw here and then reapplying the straw as needed as it breaks down. And then on the left side of this picture, you can see that we're using wood mulch. And as long as we get that wood mulch from a clean supplier where we don't have issues with poison ivy and other plant materials and other weed seeds in there, and it's a clean wood mulch, uh, for many of our hedgerows and walkways, uh, that's a good thing to use. And then the straw, of course, is going to break down and add valuable organic matter to our garden. When we use mulches, they help to conserve moisture to prevent weed problems, to increase the, uh, micro, the uh, beneficial microorganisms that exist within the soil to increase organic matter, which is extremely important that we increase organic matter in many of the soils that we have throughout New Jersey. Um, that actually helps uh, when we uh, encourage those beneficial microorganisms to actually um, uh, go ahead and uh, make those nutrients that we've provided through fertilizers or through organic means to be available to those plants. So by using these uh, organic or natural mulches, 
we can actually also increase organic matter and the um, beneficial microorganisms within that soil. And here you can see that we're using a combination of, um, you look on the right there, we're using standard black plastic, which increases the temperature. And many of our commercial farmers use black plastic. And then in the middle of the rows at the earth center, we're using landscape fabric. So the combination of those two things, landscape fabric uh, used in the center prevents weed seeds from germinating. Uh, it's a good idea to, after you've applied those landscape fabrics, to cover them with a little bit of straw or other types of mulches so that you can use those landscape fabrics uh, for two to three years in a row because the sunlight will naturally degrade the plastics and many of the fabrics that we use. So by um, covering them with a mulch, we can actually increase the viability and longevity of those different types of covers. And then when we plant our plants, whether they be eggplant or, or tomatoes or peppers that you see here, um, we can actually, um, you wanna just make a hole that's just large enough to put our transplant in, no larger, um, have uh, some type of drip irrigation uh, that's delivering uh, water and micronutrients under that system um, and not irrigating areas or fertilizing areas that don't have our crop plants. Because if we want to reduce weed problems, we don't want to irrigate areas uh, where we're going to have weeds grow. We don't want to fertilize areas where we don't have our crop plants. And here is uh, out of Cream Ridge Experiment Station, uh, we're doing some work out there. This is uh, some of uh, my colleague Bill Erickson's plots where he's using a combination of black plastics as you see where the crop is growing. And then uh, he's using landscape fabric to the right of that to prevent weeds. And he's using a very low cost method of bending pipes um, and creating uh, uh, medium sized tunnels or what we call low tunnels. And by doing that, he can have a crop that extends throughout the season. Uh, he can control weed problems throughout that. So he can get a crop all the way through October and November by doing that and be able to cover those with that plastic so that when we get cold nights, you can simply move those pegs down to protect those plants on a cold night so we can extend our growing season by doing that. So some of the mulches also that we can use that are inorganic, and that means uh, that they're not going to break down over a period of time. Um, you know, when we use stone, as you see here, um, we can get adequate control. I would avoid using white stone because white stone tends to reflect the sunlight and increase um, problems with uh, re uh, reflection of the sunlight and heat underneath the plant. Whenever we do that, we can actually increase the amount of problems that we see on many plants. So if you're gonna use stone, the bottom uh, right uh, there where you see natural stone is the best way to go. And you wanna put some landscape fabric under that so that you cover it with two inches of stone. You put the landscape fabric under that that will give you adequate weed control within that landscape setting. Um, you don't want to use this, of course, in a vegetable setting, but this is good for your landscape setting. And you can see in the bottom left where somebody went a little bit more creative where they're using a combination of mulches and they even painted some of the stones that they were using. And this is right around the corner from where I lived. And I thought that looked quite attractive or at least unusual. And here you see uh, different types of organic mulches uh, that we use at both the Earth Center and, and we see on some landscapes where we're using uh, bark mulch. And um, by using bark mulches, they break down, they add organic matter back to the soil. They prevent weeds from germinating in those areas. We can use straw, we can use, um, uh, you know, uh, different types of, of barks that have been shredded or um, it's smaller components so that they will actually help us control weed problems. Um, so here's some good examples. And typically when we use mulches, we wanna go out to the drip line of that tree, which is the outer limbs of that tree if possible. Uh, and that will allow those uh, root systems to stay cool 
It will prevent weed competition and turf competition for those weeds and actually allow for uh, a very healthy uh, plant development throughout the season. Plus also, it, uh, these mulches, we wanna put them down just two inches. Uh, we don't wanna put you know five, six inches down. We just wanna put two, three inches maximum of, of these different types of organic mulches. And the reason for that is if we put too much organic mulch down, going to suffocate those plants and we will have oxygen get to those plants uh, so that we can have adequate oxygen uh, helping those plants to take up moisture and nutrients from the soil. Any questions on that? What do you think about leaf mulch in vegetable gardens? Leaf mulch is great. The same thing, you know, just apply two or three inches. If we can compost the leaves first, that's a great idea, but we can use standard leaf mulch. I do recommend though, that if you can shred those leaves so that you have better oxygen uh, penetration and moisture penetration in those areas, but leaves can be used very effectively with most of the plants that we grow. We probably wanna cut back on that in our vegetable gardens. We can use those more in our ornamental areas to control weeds. But in our vegetable gardens, we want to use those sparingly and just on the surface. We don't want to mix those leaves that haven't been broken down by compost down into the soil because it will actually rob our uh, vegetable plants of nitrogen because the bacteria will start to break down those leaves and will take away uh, valuable nitrogen and other nutrients from those plants. So just put them on the surface at about two inches. So that will help to protect um, the root systems. It will help to prevent excessive heat and cold injury to those plants, as you see here, that by putting the mulch down, it conserves moisture, prevents weeds, um, prevents high heat, low temperatures. The most sensitive part of any plant, whether it be vegetable or ornamental, is the root system. So if we can protect that root system, we can protect that plant from short and long-term injury. Do you know if uh, black mulch attracts ticks more than others? I have not heard that black mulch attracts ticks. Uh, usually ticks are on the edge of properties where we have higher vegetation so they can attach uh, to um, larger scale organisms that are passing by, but I, do, I have not seen anything that indicates that black plastic uh, increases tick problems. So we wanna make sure that we're getting a clean product um, of mulch that's uh, free of weed problems, uh, free of weed seeds, poison ivy, and contaminants uh, that might be out there uh, to make sure that we're getting a good clean product. Another way to reduce weed problems is to make sure that we um, target our water. So if we're um, irrigating large areas, we're gonna increase weed competition, of course, in those areas. But if in the vegetable garden, we have drip irrigation uh, and we can limit the amount of irrigation uh, to just those areas where we're producing vegetables, not irrigate the whole area, we can actually increase growth of those plants that we want to grow and decrease the weed problems. And in the cases of lawns, what we want to do is irrigate early in the morning and do deep and infrequent irrigation so that we can increase the growth of lawns, uh, conserve water and reduce disease problems on those lawns. Another thing that we can do is recycle grass clippings. Grass clippings provide about 30% up to 50% of nitrogen of the needs of lawns, uh, especially for growing fine fescues and turf type tall fescues, they have a much deeper root system. So by recycling grass clippings, we can actually uh, see uh, the recycling of nutrients and increase of microbiological activity to those areas. Uh, it's a great slow release source of nitrogen. And what Joe Heckman has found in his many years of research is that by recycling clippings, lawns will green up earlier and stay green uh, longer in the fall. That's one of the best things we can do in a landscape setting. We can also use grass clippings within our vegetable gardens, but we wanna make sure that we haven't used 2,4-D uh, or any other type of um, broadleaf herbicides that will actually have a negative impact on our vegetable gardens. So we wanna wait, if we've used those products, we wanna wait at least four to six weeks 
after we've used those uh, to use the grass clippings as a nitrogen source. Fertilization, apply a fertilizer based on soil tests. Concentrate your fertilizer within those areas where you have your vegetables growing. And um, that will help us to be able to control weed problems because we're not fertilizing the weeds. Liming, you know, adjust that lime so that those plants are growing uh, at, at the optimal uh, rate. So we want to adjust most of our areas where we're growing vegetables and lawns to about 6.2 to 6.5. And the same thing for many of our vegetable crops. Uh, control thatch whenever we see it. And thatch is this area of, and lawns where we see dead and dying uh, roots and crown tissue. And by decreasing that to uh, less than a half inch, we can reduce uh, many of our weed problems. Dethatching can actually help to reduce that. So we want to do that in the fall. We can sometimes do it in the spring as well. We can use a dethatcher to do that. That in combination with overseeding can actually increase the uh, density of turf grass. And if we remove that thatch, then there's a better chance that oxygen nutrients are going to get to those lower areas. Coeration is something we can do in areas where we've got compaction problems. And what that does is it decreases compaction so that we can have turf grass um, by doing deep digging in vegetable gardens. We do the same thing or we reduce compaction and we increase the chances of our uh, vegetable plants and uh, also our uh, turf grass of being able to grow uh, without inhibiting the growth of the root systems. Uh, we want it whenever we do core aeration, we want to break up core plugs, um, aerate uh, early in the fall. But if we have to do it in the spring, we can also do it then. We just want to make sure that we're adjusting pH at that time and adding organic materials to help break down those plugs. And I'm going to stop there. If there's any last minute questions, we can take those. Why don't you recommend landscape fabric for the vegetable garden? Uh, you can use landscape fabric. Um, I have used it uh, in the rows and between the rows. Um, and what you want to do is if you're going to use landscape fabric, um, you want to make sure you cover it with a little bit of straw or other types of mulch so that sunlight uh, doesn't get to it and break it down because sunlight will destroy many of our plastics and landscape fabrics when it's uh, in direct contact uh, with solar radiation. So by utilizing um, some type of cover, even if it's a minimal amount of cover, we can prevent um, erosion or um, wear of that material. Um, and we can also at the same time prevent solar degradation of those plastics and other materials. Do you think it's okay to buy mulch from Home Depot or Lowe's? I do, um, as long as the origin of that product says that it's, it's wood mulch. Um, and doesn't contain any other contaminants, I would probably recommend knowing the source of your mulch a little bit more. It's also smell it because if you if you have an odd smell coming off of any mulch or even soil materials that you're adding, uh, if it smells like ammonia or has a very unusual scent to it, I would avoid it and go with another product. I don't know if you're familiar with salt hay, but in the chat we were talking about salt hay. Do you know? Uh, do you want to explain the difference between salt hay and straw? Well, straw, I would stick with straw because there's very little what I would call salt hay left uh, uh, around that's really um, salt hay. So I would look for straw that doesn't have uh, uh, either rye or wheat or, you know, where you see actual seed heads still remaining. I would avoid hay because hay has a lot of weed seeds in it to begin with. And the availability of salt hay uh, is extremely limited anymore. So I think what some people are calling salt hay is basically hay with a lot of weed seeds in it. So I personally would not buy that. Hmm. Okay, because I always thought that salt hay was from Spartina grass. Well, and, it, uh, it, it kind of, I think it kind of depends on the source. It should be, that would be the origin. But, you know, with me, with 32 years of experience, um, it's not always what it what it's labeled. And unfortunately, we don't have people out there monitoring that on a regular basis. So 
Thank you everyone for joining us tonight. We uh, invite you to our uh, Rutgers Beginner Farmer Program starting up in May. Uh, please contact us ASAP. We are planning on having running our Master Gardener Program starting again this fall. So if you would like to join that, please contact Master Gardeners uh, at co.middlesex.nu.us. And I thank everyone for attending tonight. Dave and Angela, thank you very much for your uh, help tonight. If we didn't get to your questions, you can email the Master Gardeners at mastergardeners at co.middlesex.nj.us. If you have any other questions about your garden, landscaping questions, lawn questions, you can email the Master Gardeners and or you can call them at 732-398. 5278 and we will get to your question okay thanks everybody have a great night